life and my life is like a lamp to a world that is searching for the path. We have become the example of Christ and we are now the light of the world. Can the world see the radiance of Christ in you? Evangelism does not happen by accident. Discipleship does not happen by accident. If we're going to fulfill our God-given mission as a church, we need to be intentional and reach out and share and introduce people to Jesus Christ. is an amazing continent with 50% of its population under the age of 18. If we impact the children, we would have impacted the future of the church and the future of our world. Each one of us has something to bring to the table. Are you willing to release your resources, surrendering your material goods or your gifts and talents or your time or your heart? What are you going to do? If we're going to plant the 300 churches, if we're going to reach out to a million people through evangelism, if we're going to disciple 100,000 in this nation, and if we are going to have an impact with the poor, with the needy, with children, with all the others who are part of our communities around us, it's not going to happen unless you have committed yourself to the purposes of God and you have been faithful to live by those purposes. Good afternoon, Nairobi Chapel. It's indeed a delight and an honor to be here before you as we come to the conclusion of our sermon series, The Long Weekend. Pastor, sorry, Reverend Kabibi uh, led us through the first weekend of our Easter where he talked about the betrayal, Judas who betrayed Jesus. The following weekend after that, I believe Reverend Faith talked and preached and spoke about the trial and the amazing declaration she made as she gave, hit the hammer, declaring us free. And the following Sunday, which is last Sunday, Reverend Khabib, uh, Collins led us through the tree and the facts about the cross, that we need to accept the facts about the cross. Today, I would like to share with you the last uh, T, which is triumph, but I believe before the triumph, before resurrection, Jesus was put in the tomb. So allow that we go through that this afternoon. It, this morning, I recall uh, that the last time I was here, there was also an opportunity for me to walk on water. So this is a second miracle, you see, today that I'm walking on water. A story is told that one time a pastor was baptizing, just as we did see here, a young man, and he told him, Charles, today I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now everything you have that goes under the water belongs to God. And he dipped him. And instantly, Charles' hand was up. And guess what was above? His wallet. <laughs> so many times we go in, but our wallet doesn't go down with us. Anyhow, allow me to talk about and share with you about what I believe or what I have called the before, before the long weekend. And now that we are celebrating the after, after the long weekend. And before I do that, allow me to read a portion of scripture the record, the account by Matthew of the resurrection. And I read 
Matthew 28, the, all the 30 verses, Matthew chapter 28. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, other, and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel of the Lord said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has risen from the dead and, and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, he, Jesus met them. Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped at his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There I will see, they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with them, uh, with the elders, and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and he will and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this day. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, of, the son, of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. That's the reading of his word this morning. Allow me to take a few steps back to recount the events, events that happened before the betrayal, before the trial, before Jesus being put on the cross, on the tree, before even the tomb, and before the triumph. It was on the Friday, a week before, Jesus arrived at Bethany. And he arrived for six days before the Passover was spent with his uh, friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. The following Tuesday was when Jesus, still in Bethany, Mary anointed his feet with costly perfume to account for her humility and love for him. Then on the Saturday, the Sabbath, the day of rest, though it's not recorded in any of the Gospels, but Jesus spent the Sabbath as it was traditional to do with friends and family. The Sunday before the, trial, the trials, before betrayal, before the hanging on the tree, Jesus is celebrated by his disciples where they sing as has been pro, was, was prophesied in Zechariah 9.9 that the crowd could, um, proclaimed and celebrated him as the Messiah. And they said in Psalms, as in Psalms 119, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you, ascribing and celebrating his messianic title as an agent of God, a king coming for Israel. 
Then on the, Bible, on the Monday, the Bible records Jesus is um, angry at what he sees in the temple when he gets there. And he drives out all the Gentile traders, all those who are money changing for, and making large profits. Jesus drove them out saying, my house will be known as the house of prayer. It was on the Tuesday where he taught his disciples the controversial parables. He even warned them about the Pharisees. Then the Wednesday came, and as is recorded by Mark, it was a day of rest, and, and did, Christ did not do anything. On the, on the Thursday, Jesus shared the last Passover, a very significant time with his disciples. He spends with the upper room. They shared the Passover meal, and he gave it a new meaning. The loaf of bread and the cup of wine was now representing his body. He was telling them that he will die for them, that his body and his blood would be shed. And this instituted for us, as a church, the Lord's Supper. And after singing a hymn, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Judas led the soldiers to capture him and beginning that long weekend on that Friday. Now it's recorded that Jesus was betrayed by, G by Judas, was arrested by the Romans, deserted by disciples, false trials and accusations were laid against him by the high priest. His friend Peter denied him when the cock crowed. The Jews condemned him and they asked for Barabbas and the release of Barabbas and asked that Jesus be put on the tree. And as this was happening, he was beaten. He was mocked. He carried his cross to the place of the skull where he would be crucified. And the fulfillment of more than 300 promises began coming into being. Then after his death, Friday night, Jesus is placed, his body is placed in a tomb. This was obviously before 6 p.m. when Sabbath began and no work was to be done. He lay in the tomb all Sabbath, throughout all Sabbath. Friends, before the long weekend of betrayal, of trial, or hanging on the tree, he lay in the tomb. The Son of God lay in the tomb. And this was because man, you and I, had sinned and were eternally separated from God. Before that long weekend, Jesus, the Son of God, came so that all who believe will have eternal life. Before that long weekend, the trial, the betrayal, the tomb, the tree, even the triumph, Jesus had done many miracles so that his disciples may see. And for us is recorded so that we may believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing, we may have eternal life. This afternoon, my big question is, do you believe? Do you believe? Friends, faith is that active, um, active uh, position that you take. That you can come as the young ones or those who did before us, making a declaration of faith, of obedience, and continuous trust in Jesus Christ. When we believe his life, when we believe Jesus' words, when we believe that he died, when we believe his resurrection, we are cleansed from sin and receive power to follow him. Friends, do we believe? Do you believe? Allow me to recount the passage we've just read. Mary was among the women who went early in the morning to the tomb. And as they went there, scripture records, they were actually wondering among themselves, how will we roll the stone away? But it's recorded that just before they went, they got there, they found the entrance of the tomb was open. The stone had been rolled back. An angel of the Lord was there sitting on it. And he told them, Jesus is alive. He gave them the message, Jesus is alive. And instructed them to go tell the brothers. And as they were doing this, 
Jesus appeared to them, as indeed we shall recount. He appears to them the first time. And the first two people he appeared was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And tells them, go tell my brothers. I recall that one time he goes and he's in the upper room with the disciples and he walks through the wall and he tells them the many promises and the many prophetic things that have gone on. And as he broke bread, their eyes opened. But there was one man called Thomas who needed to touch, who needed to feel, who needed to see. And Jesus asked him and said to him, Blessed are they that have not seen, yet they believe. Friends, you and I need to walk by faith. You and I need to walk by faith and not by sight. The appearance of Jesus to, to Mary Magdalene in the garden was one not only witnessed to his disciples, but also to a hostile, what we'd call a hostile witness. The guards, the guards who saw all this, the guards who saw the stone rolled away by the angels, and they were so frightened that they played dead. Talk about Afro cinema at its best. Dead men alive. But their scripture records that they were the first, the second witnesses who went to the high priest to say what had happened. They went and told the high priest all that they had seen. And the high priest, of course, came up with a plan to devise that that story be quenched. Scripture records that the seal by the Romans was not able to be pushed away other than the miracle of God himself. So the guards were also a witness to this. The probability that Christ Jesus raised from the tomb shortly after sundown the night before was that he was already risen before the opening of the tomb. Why do I say this? The rolling away of the stone was not to let Jesus out. The rolling away of the stone was not to let Jesus out. But I believe it was to let Mary and the disciples in to be witnesses, to see the resurrection, that Jesus' body no longer lay in the tomb. Friends, the rolling of the stone is so that you and I can have a witness and a true faith that he we, who we believe is no longer dead, is alive. No wonder the disciples, the angel came to the disciples and asked Mary, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is no longer here. He is alive. The one you're looking for is alive. He is not dead. He is not dead. Friends, today there are many who still do not believe in the resurrected Jesus. The evidence that Jesus Christ actually arose demonstrates his uniqueness in history. It proves that he is the son of God and that no one has ever been able to predict his death and accomplish it. Some have said that Jesus was not dead. Actually, he was just unconscious. And so when they lay him to the tomb, after the three days, he revived. But that's not true. Scripture details and is recorded that the Roman soldiers who were at the hostile witness, who were the ones against, went and told Pilate that Jesus is dead. To confirm the prophecy that they did not break his legs for him to die. They pierced him on the side and he died. So the, the proposition that he was unconscious is not true. Some have said, because it was women who Jesus appeared first to, they went to the wrong tomb. In fact, they say so. Of course, there was a cultural bias, but that's my own feeling, not the scriptures. That the women went to the wrong tomb. However, Peter, when Mary told the disciples who were hiding, Peter and John ran, and they went to the very tomb Mary was in. So they had the tomb right. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene had actually seen where 
Joseph of Arimathea put the tomb, they knew his tomb, put the body, they knew it was his tomb. Others have said that unknown thieves, maybe his disciples stole the body. They, they construed this story. They even said the religious leaders stole the body so that they can produce it later. But that was not so. The tomb had been sealed and guarded by Roman soldiers. Roman soldiers who were so feared that even the disciples seeing their violence and, and their mean and terror that gripped the people, they ran away. They ran away. And clearly, this rumor of the resurrection has not died. Friends, some of us as we hear, and many people as they hear the story of resurrection for the first time, they need to comprehend, they need to understand this amazing story. And like Mary, they may pass through, or we may pass through four different stages. The first one, like Mary, is a stage of unbelief, disbelief, and they say, no, it can't be. That's not true. He's not alive. We know he's dead. And they can't believe. It's a non-truth. The second person is like Peter. Who, though the women had walked with him, he knew them well, he needed to see and to investigate and to prove and count the facts. Was it true? Is his body there or not? Some of us need to see the third category, to see, to believe. Like Thomas, he says, I need to touch. Lord, I need to feel in order to believe. Then there's the third category, who Jesus said, Blessed are you who believe, even though you do not see. Because they believe, they commit, and devote to follow Jesus. The proof of Christ's resurrection was recounted over and over again, almost 17 to 18 times. Not only did Jesus appear to the Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, he appeared to other women. He appeared to his disciples. He appeared to the two men walking on the Emmaus road. He appeared to disciples in supernatural ways. He walked into their rooms, their houses. He even proved to doubting Thomas. His appearance much later on, the same week, to the disciples on Galilee, on the Mount of Olives. He appeared, Paul says, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul arguing for the faith, he says he appeared to over 500 people. He appeared to James. He appeared to disciples and telling them all authorities given to him. He appeared to Paul on the way to Damascus. Before the long weekend, friends, before the betrayal, before the trial, before the tree, there was the tomb. There was the tomb. And man had sinned and was eternally separated from God. Jesus, the Son of God, came that we may believe in the eternal life. And that we who hear, we who see the miracles of what he did and said might believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And by believing, we have eternal life. My big question, do you believe? Do you believe that the tomb is empty? Do you believe that the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea placed the body of Jesus is empty? Now it is said this Joseph was actually a learned man. man. He was like the Pharisees, but he did not want to publicly look like he was opposed to what was happening. So he silently followed Jesus. He was an honored member of the Sanhedrin. He was afraid to speak against the religious leaders opposing Jesus. But now he is bold enough to go and ask for the body of Jesus. He's courageous asking to take Jesus' body from the cross and bury it. The disciples who had publicly followed Jesus were now nowhere to be seen. But Joseph stands out as recorded in scripture as one whose life was changed by the death more than the life. Joseph of Arimathea was changed by the death 
more than the life. He realized that Jesus was truly the son of God. He believed that Jesus was truly who he said he was. He realized that this message had to change his faith drastically and he had to do something. When we are confronted by the truth of the resurrected Jesus, our lives cannot be the same. The tomb represented for the disciples a tragic end to the man and the one they hoped who'd come to free them from the hard slavery and difficult times by the Roman rule and unfair and unjust system. That king was now dead and in the tomb. The tomb today, for some of us, may represent a death, an unproductive situation, a deadness of business, deadness of job, deadness of relationship, deadness of marriage, deadness of family, deadness of communication, deadness and death in our environment, unproductive, unyielding, whatever it is, situation. But the angel of the Lord is saying to you and I, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is risen. Question, do you believe? Do you believe? Friends, the stone rolling away was symbolic. It was symbolic because it was the door that removed and removed had held back sin and death. Death, death's house was firmly secured by this huge stone. But this same stone becomes the trophy to which our faith can stand. That Jesus could get out even before the stone is rolled away. So that you and I may get in and see the risen Savior. The stone also signifies that that is what our faith rests upon, the solid foundation. And like Paul defends the faith and says, if he died upon the tree and did not rise again from the tomb, then your faith is in vain. Your faith is empty. Paul further says that Jesus died and rose to demonstrate the uniqueness in history and proves that the Son of God and no one else in the history of mankind can predict his death and accomplish it. No one else other than the Son of God predicted his death and accomplished it. Paul is telling us it is proof that the resurrection is why the gospel was preached, because it transformed lives. You and I, when we interact with the risen Savior, our lives are transformed. Our faith, my friends, is not in vain. We can stand on the solid rock that is the Savior. The grace of salvation we get is from resurrection. This morning, we saw a demonstration, or this afternoon, of faith and faith made alive. May I share with you the truth? The principal doctrinal truth. Why we baptize and immerse in water. We don't do it halfway. You have to go in dead. Why? Jesus died and resurrection and resurrected. So we are baptized and submerged physically underwater. Just as Christ died and rose from the death, from beneath the earth. So the baptized person raises again from beneath the water. Under the water, the believer's old ways. And it was amazing, Pastor Bella spoke about the tambourine and how the, the, the walls and the water parted. So the old, the dead, the heavy, the suffocating, the perishing, the dead. Old has gone and the new is up, arising with Christ Jesus. We are cleansed by his blood. Friends, our faith is because of the resurrection. Our assuredness, our confidence, our surety is because of the resurrected Jesus. Peter tells us that the water of baptism symbolizes that now you and I are saved. Just to emphasize for those of us who've never been immersed by water, 
that it is not the removal of dirt, 1 Peter 3.21 says, of the body, but a pledge of a clear conscience. And that's why for every candidate being baptized, we repeat the same statement. Upon the confession of your faith, God saves you with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Paul says, we therefore are buried through the baptism into death in order that Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead through glory, the Father may give us new life. It's amazing that in Paul, in Paul and Romans, rather, Paul still says, Romans 8, 11, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give you life into your mortal bodies because his spirit lives in you. Friends, this week I wondered, and if the spirit of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in me, if that same spirit, the resurrected spirit, the resurrection spirit lives in you and I, why do I still go back to the tomb? Like Mary, why has grief so engrossed me? Why is my focus on the dead and the dying situations in my life? Why are there so many dead situations around us? Why am I not being productive and, and yielding fruit as I'm required to? Why are some important relationships dead? Why am I not getting 100% yield if the resurrected Jesus is in me? Why are my business ideas dying? Why are there frustrations and deadness? Why are my creative innovations and ideas yielding? Why is my talent under the bushel? Why are investments dying and, and finances dying? Marriages, relationships dying. Could it be? Could it be like Mary? We are holding back and wanting to go into the tomb because we do not believe. Yet, we have done all that needs to be done. We've actually carried the incense. And the reason they carried the incense is just the way you and I, when there's a funeral, we carry flowers to acknowledge. Why is it that like Mary, we run back even with Peter and John not believing? We need to see again. Could it be that we have stayed away too long from reading our Bible and praying? Such so that when Jesus calls us Mary, Mark, that we don't recognize his voice and say, Rabboni, teacher, Rabboni, teacher. Could it be that we've stayed too long away from the teacher? Could it be that we are too disobedient from what he instructs us to do? Could it be like the four-year-old, Zidi, we do not spend time to read our Bible and pray every day, to stay connected with the resurrected Savior. Could it be that we do not allow him to speak into our circumstances? Could it be that we are filled with grief from the trial, from the betrayal, from the tree and the tomb? Could it be? that we are so consumed with our circumstances that we do not see that after the long weekend, after the betrayal, after the trial, after Jesus hanging on the tree, we still do not believe. We still do not believe. Friends, I come to announce to you today, and I come to announce to someone here today, that Jesus is alive. This is not a history, recounting of history, that today he is alive. He is alive in you and I. And I want to do something prophetic, and prophetic is a pronouncement over us, that any dead thing, any dead situation, any dead circumstance comes alive. Isaiah prophesied, Isaiah 61, he said, 
and was speaking of Jesus, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed the Lord to preach the good news. And that's what he did and has given us the mandate to go tell. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the Lord's vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. To provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. A spirit of gladness instead of despair. A garment of praise instead of mourning. And they and you and I will be called ox of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And as the horn is blown, I ask that if you're seated here today and have dead someone, dead something, dead circumstance, that you'd want to come alive because the power of resurrection is seated here. I ask that by the grace of God, you stand in confession of your faith that Jesus is alive. Jesus can turn things around. Jesus can replace the dead situations to bring life and breathe life into it. And I'll just do it for coordination's sake. Count one to three. And that's, if that's you, rise to your feet. Rise to your feet. So let's go one, two, three. In Jesus' name. I ask that we blow the horn of trumpet of victory because when victory is won, when battles are won, a sound is made in the heavenlies. A sound is made to us. So if we have it, let's go. It worked in the first service. But I declare to you that your broken heart is mended in Jesus' name. Amen. That if you're free, if you're bonded, bonded by whatever circumstances, you're free and you're no longer captive of sin, death, and darkness in Jesus' name. Amen. That you're released from darkness like a prisoner made free by the Spirit of the living God. I proclaim, hallelujah, the Lord's favor over you this day. And avenge for you amongst your enemies. And now the garment of mourning is replaced in Jesus' name. And that you have the spirit of gladness, the resurrected spirit, alive and resting over you in Jesus' name. Because we shall be called ox of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the favor and display of his favor. Friends, thank you very much. You may be seated. That the living stone, which was rejected, becomes the living stone built into the spiritual house. You and I, we are called a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus is key to you and my faith. Jesus died on the third day, resurrected on the third day, so that you and I may be confident in the faith that he accomplishes all he has promised. That he is the ruler of the heavens and the earth. That you and I can be confident of our own resurrection on that day. Friends, Jesus is coming back in triumphant entry. And that Trumpets shall sound, 2 Corinthians 15, 51. Allow me to read. The trumpets shall sound, and the Lord's coming and return will be made known. And Paul says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, 
at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised. The imperishable will be changed. For the imperishable must close itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the, imper Im the immortal. And therefore, we shall be changed with a twinkling of an eye. Scripture records that currently Jesus Christ is seated on the throne, seated in reign, seated in authority. And so his resurrection is that he's at the right hand of the Father, in control. That the earth and the world is no longer death and doom. That we have and we shall reign with him with eternity, in eternity. That he will judge the living and the dead. He is the resurrected Savior, the soon and coming King. And as is been recorded, now there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, John wrote. The Revelator, Revelations 21. The first heaven and the last, will, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there are no longer any seas. But I saw, John says, a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming out from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed as a husband. And we shall be saying together with the angels, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is his footstool. The heavens is his throne. Friends, he is alive. He is not dead. Do you believe? Let us arise as we pray, and pray that we be those who are blessed, that even though we do not see, even though we have not touched, we believe that the resurrected Savior lives in us. Father, we thank you for the power, the resurrected power that lives in everyone who believes. We thank you that you not only changed our destiny, our eternity, but that you change even today. That all of us who are in you can walk in triumph because the one who raised you from the dead lives in us. Our precious Father, this morning, we come once again reminded that we are more than conquerors through you who gives us strength. Our precious Father, we ask that in this coming week, you give us strength to overcome circumstances that we do not know how to deal. Allow that you take us to the place that you teach us, Raboni. Allow that you take us to the place where you call us out by name. Allow that in the coming week and in the coming season, and in this you call your day of grace, that we may see you in everything we do and we are about. Father, we thank you because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world who sometimes threatens us. We thank you because we are called by your name. You are, we are yours. And so to him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you before his glorious throne without blame or wrinkle, and in victory, and in confidence, and in triumph, that he is alive, and therefore you will live with him in eternity. Be praise, be glory, be majesty, both now and forevermore. Amen.